welcome to Catching Up with Council. I'm your host, Leah Hasledge. Today, we're catching up with Ward 8 Councilman Mike Polensic. Welcome, Councilman. Glad to be here. So tell us how long you've represented Ward 8 and what neighborhoods that's comprised of. Well, I've rep re represented Ward 8 for some time now, but I've been in City Council for 12 consecutive terms, 41 years, probably not a good sign of mental stability, but nonetheless, <laughs> <laughs> I represented three different wards, Ward 26, Ward 11, and now Ward 8, all on the northeast side of the city in one shape or form. So I'm it, the, the senior <laughs> member of City Council. And which neighborhoods? I know Collinwood. So one of it would them. be North Shore Collinwood. It would be Collinwood Village, uh, part of the Nottingham Village area, and then part of what we call East Glenville. So I, again, my ward zigzags like yeah. a saw from East 200th Street down Eddy Road. So it's it's a unique neighborhood. It's a neighborhood that I've lived in all my life. I was born in the Glenville neighborhood on East 120th Street, and, and same home my mother was born into, my grandparents' house. Then from there, my mother moved us over to the Collinwood community on a street called Darley. And then from Darley, a little bit east of that. So my world, that's my world. My great-grandparents lived on 47th Street off of uh, between Superior and Payne Avenue. So it's not a big world, but it's the only world that I've known, and it's, it's been a great community. Are you a Collinwood High School alum? Yes, I am. Once a railroader, always a railroader. <laughs> Remember that. That's what, Stephanie Tubbs Jones and I were dear friends, late congresswoman. And um, we would always whisper, when we'd hug each other, we'd always whisper that in each other's ear. Once Aww. a railroader, always a railroader. That's sweet. Very proud of that fact. Yeah. Did you know that you always wanted to be in politics? Were you in student government oh, growing no. up and all that? <laughs> no. Politics was the last thing I thought I'd ever wind up in. Hmm. I wanted to be an architect. I wanted to be an engineer. And um, unfortunately, I lacked the math skills for that. So um, when I was in Collinwood, I was in, uh, then we had what they call, um, uh, it was like an industrial arts program, a uh, co-op program. So I went to school in the morning, and then at noon, I left and went to, to work at a company, then called um, Clevite Graphite Bronze, which ultimately became Gould, and I worked in their engineering department. So I thought that that's what I was going to wind up at, but due to cutbacks in, in all the manufacturing plants and facilities across the entire city. All those plants and factories started to close in like in the late 60s, um, early 70s, and that continued. Then I went from, uh, I went worked at White Motors on St. Clair. I was United Auto Worker, something I'm very proud of. Yeah. And I also worked for United Torch, a special program through the Lake Erie Girl Scout Council, trying to get kids, girls involved in programs within the city. So oh, wow. I've done it all. And through my involvement in the community, my mother instilled in all of us when we were kids growing up in Collinwood, you got to be involved in something. Whether So my, my sisters were involved in cheerleading and what they called the high steppers and in different programs. I played football for Collinwood. She insisted that we be engaged in something. So she was what I want to call a neighborhood activist in the day. Um, raising four kids was very uh, difficult for her, and at times on public assistance, because she was the head of household. And, um, but she instilled us, this is your neighborhood, get involved. And so my first involvement in politics, I was just a kid, and I came home one day, and mom said, gave me a stack of literature, and she said, you're gonna pass this out. And I said, where do you want me to pass this out? <laughs> she said, on Clear Air, I'll never forget the name of the streets, on, on Penhurst, Clear Air, Claremont, and Larchmont in the Nottingham neighborhood. And I said, what is? She said, it's campaign literature. And I was just a kid. You know, the only thing I was worried about, the, the only thing I cared about at that time was girls, cars, and football, okay? <laughs> uh, and it all depends what day and what order. But the literature, f f funny to, to think back about it, was for Carl Stokes. Oh. And here I was a kid, and mom was one of those early supporters of Carl Stokes, which a fact that uh, Lou Stokes never ever forgot, uh, always reminded me uh, of it. Um, so I passed out the literature. I didn't even know who Carl Stokes was. All I said, you know, when mom gave you an order, you did it. Right. So I passed <laughs> out the literature. It was my first engagement. I think that was like 60, 1967, something like that. Um, and then became involved in the community and then became president of the, one of the oldest civic clubs in the community called the Nottingham Civic Club, which is still around. I think they're about 70, 75 years old, the club. Three-term 
president of Nottingham Civic Club, and one thing led to another. I ran for Cleveland City Council and was elected in um, November of 1977, you know, before you were born. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not by much, I, but okay. yes. <laughs> yeah. and, um, and so since 1977, November 1977, was sworn in office in 1978, so been there ever since. I, it, someone asked me years ago, would you, would you ever envision serving in city council this long? No. I thought I was going to get called back by the United Auto Workers. I was going to go back and be a United Auto Worker because I was making more money as a United <laughs> Auto Worker than I was in city council. But, um, but lo and behold, um, I, I really uh, came to enjoy the job because how many people in city council today can say they represent or serve the neighborhood that they grew up in and their parents grew up in and their grandparents grew up in. Not too many. Mm -hmm. I can say that. So to me, it's been a great honor, a great joy. Every time I walk in the city hall, it might sound corny, but I'm awed every day I walk in, and especially when I walk into the council chamber, because I never thought I'd be there. So, you know, I, I appreciate it very much. I, I didn't get elected to build a law practice or to build a real estate empire or um, an insurance business or whatever the case may be. I got elected to serve and I've never thought, I never forgot about that. And being close to Lou Stokes, um, he said to me one time, we were sitting at the old call post office, uh, call and post newspaper office up on, on Chester Avenue. And he said to me one day, we were talking about a whole bunch of stuff. And he said, you can be for whatever you want. I always remember these two things. He said, you can be for whatever you want. You can be extremely conservative. You can be extremely liberal. I don't care. I don't care what it is, but unless you get elected, you can't affect change. That was the first lesson I learned. The other lesson was never forget where you came from and never forget who you represent. I've never forgot that. So every time I cast a vote, I think about the people I represent. And if they were sitting in my chair, how would they vote? And I think so often in public office today, especially on a national level, we see people who have forgotten about that, who they represent, what are they there for? Mm -hmm. It's not to position themselves to run for this or to run for that, or again, or to become wealthy individuals, it's to represent their constituents. And I, somehow we collectively, we've got to get back to that in this country. Yes. This, this, by, this, this constant conflict and adversarial stuff we see nationally, even statewide, does none of us any good. I don't care what political party you are or what affiliation, does us no good. We've got to work together to make our city, our county, our state, and our country the best it can be. That's my goal. I love that. Definitely don't put party over policy. I don't. Yeah. I don't. I never put party. I'm a Democrat, but, I've never, but I'm, you know, I'm an American first, and I'm a Clevelander first. And I, so I'm here to work with my colleagues. I'm here to work across the aisle. Most people know George Voinovich and I were very good friends. Mm -hmm. There's times we didn't agree, mm -hmm. but we all, our position was we could disagree and still be agreeable. We could still remain friends. So again, that's lost today. It's even lost in Ohio. We see it in Columbus. For some reason, everything's become so adversarial, so contentious. And I believe the people lose in that, in that environment. I agree. Yeah. yeah. So your neighborhood, yeah. Collinwood right. in particular, is this year's Chain Reaction Neighborhood. Right. For those not familiar, what is Chain Reaction and what's this going to bring for the neighborhood? Well, Chain Reaction is a, is a process and a program where you bring in outside investors who put up money to help uh, incubate new businesses coming into the neighborhood. So it's through Channel 8, it's in partnership with Fox 8, um, and we really appreciate them picking Collinwood. And, um, we, um, we, are, we are excited, we are working with them, we're working with local investors uh, to create an environment where we can bring different types of business in. They don't have to be restaurants or retail, it could be a small manufacturing company, it could be whatever. We all have come to the realization, I hope in this community, that we gotta create jobs. Yeah. Jobs create stability. Uh, again, uh, one of the dear things that I remember from my late dear friend Stephanie Tubbs Jones would talk to me, and we would talk about creating personal wealth. How do we create personal wealth? I'm not talking about Donald Trump personal wealth. I'm talking about where you can buy a comb 
You can buy a car, you can put your kids through school, you can buy furniture, you can support yourself and your family. That's the personal wealth I understand. So the only way we do this is by creating jobs and opportunity. Edu and education as well ties right into that. So what we're hoping with Chain Reaction, we're gonna bring new businesses into the neighborhood, incubate them, hopefully they're gonna grow, hire people because small business in Cleveland is the backbone of our neighborhood. Definitely. It's not the big chains. Mm -hmm. We don't see them anymore. They, have, for yeah. the most part, have abandoned our city. Mm -hmm. But it's those small businesses. It's the, the boutiques. It's the restaurants. It's the, the beauty parlors. It's the barber shops. It's the, the bakeries, the meat markets. It's all those things that contribute to the viability of one's neighborhood. When you look at uh, uh, the greater Collinwood community, I'm very fortunate that I still have all those types of businesses. Yeah. In fact, prior to coming here, where was I? I had a little meat market uh, called Riddell's. I went to two of them, Ajman's and Riddell's, to make sure I got <laughs> the stuff for Easter. I had, I, had to, I had to get the sausage for Easter. I was in trouble. Um, but it's, it's so great. And, and a, little man, a little elderly man said to me, as I, w as I was uh, coming in and he was walking out, and he, he, he didn't know who I was. He just made a comment. He said, everybody that comes out of here is smiling. <laughs> And, it's, and I thought about it for me, it's right. It's, it's that joy of just supporting these small neighborhood businesses. And everybody's in there talking and, and buying stuff and getting ready for the holiday. And it was like, I'm so fortunate. You know, I'm one of the few neighborhoods in the city of Cleveland that have bank. I have three banks in my ward. Yeah. There's neighborhoods that don't even have a bank left. There's neighbors that don't have a, a drugstore or, or a grocery store. Yeah. So that's why I've worked so hard on development opportunities. It's one of the reasons why I work so hard on the East Side Market yeah. with my colleagues in the Glenville neighborhood. Glenville was, is a food desert. Um, there, there is a lack of fresh produce, fresh meat. What we see for the most part on the East Side and East Side neighborhoods, we see these little corner stores mm -hmm. and all they do is push beer, wine, cigarettes, yeah, lottery. and lottery tickets. Yeah. Wait a minute. Our people deserve more than that, and they need more than that. They need fresh fruit and vegetables. They need fresh meats. They need bakery items. So linking up with my colleagues, Councilman Anthony Harrison, Councilman uh, Kevin Conwell, and prior to that, Councilman Jeff Jansen, representing the old 10th Ward, we worked together as a team to help create the East Side Market. And then working with the mayor and his team, it was a partnership of coming together at 105th in St. Clair, because I can remember that when I was a kid. That was like downtown. On the east side, we had two downtowns outside of downtown. We had five points, 152nd, mm -hmm. 105th in St. Clair, and then downtown. Mm -hmm. Between those two east side neighborhoods, if you couldn't get it there, you went downtown. But then again, due to business move out, especially big businesses, which then had a tremendous domino effect on the small businesses in the neighborhood. We lost all that. So we were committed. The east side market is officially open. I would hope anyone who's living in the city of Cleveland would go over to 105th and St. Clair, partake. It's a beautiful market, beautiful operation. And we're just hoping that people are gonna support it because that old saying, if you don't use it, you lose it. It's for sure. And if we don't yeah. support our neighborhood businesses in the city, those that respect our neighborhood, our neighborhoods, uh, then we don't have it. And then we have to get in the car and go outside of the community. So by supporting local businesses, we're supporting local jobs, supporting local tax base, help re reinvigorate our neighborhoods. It's critical. You're putting that money right back into the community by spending exactly. it. It's exactly. It's the whole, that when you hear about the trickle down theory, that's real trickle down. Because when you talk, so often we hear from big business, when they talk about the trickle down, it doesn't exist. It usually right. trickles up. We defy gravity. We, it goes up to the big guys. We need it to trickle down into our neighborhood so people can benefit from that. You were adamant from day one about the East Side Market. What was the thing that most sparked your need to make sure that this happened for the community? Well, it's just what I said. It was the, the fact that the Glenville neighborhood had slid substantially. I never represented the Glenville neighborhood until the last redistricting. Um, I, was, I had always been on the northeast side with this most recent redistricting. I came down to Eddy Road and I, I, I was born one street west, uh, west of Eddy Road on 120th. I was just astonished by how much the neighborhood had declined. I was just, as I drove through the neighborhood, the abandoned homes, the abandoned factories, the abandoned 
businesses, um, the poverty, the despair, and then going back to what I just said about the, these stores that come in who don't respect the community and they just want to push certain items. Like that's all we're good for is beer, wine, and cigarettes? Right. Come on. So uh, I made it, I, I made it a, a personal conviction and a, and a, and a personal, personal dream that I was going to work with my colleagues. And one of the things we do on the northeast side of the city, we work across ward boundaries. Historically in the city, because I'm the senior member, no one has ever served longer than me in city government, you would never work outside your ward boundary. You were always, you know, you'd never cross that boundary. You know, you would drive across it, but you never got engaged. The three of us, starting with Jeff Johnson, myself, and Kevin Conwell, we embarked upon this program, the Northeast Coalition, where we were going to work across ward boundaries on common issues. It was very successful. The East Side Market is a prime example of that. I mean, in a day, I would have never been engaged in the East Side Market, but I was because I understood the importance of it to my section of Glenville. Kevin, now Anthony Harrison. So we continue to work on that process on a whole bunch of issues. And, and I'm hoping that, that 105th and St. Clair, that that is going to help incubate other businesses to grow out from it. Only time will tell, but that goes back about people need to support it. If we don't support these businesses in our neighborhood, then um, we pay the ultimate price. We have empty storefronts, we have disinvestment. And we all know today in 2019, as we've seen not only in Cleveland but nationally, people will talk with their feet. They'll go to where there's opportunities. They'll go to where there's better shopping, again, better schools, better housing, et cetera. So we have to be competitive. The city of Cleveland has to be competitive because the northeast side, like where I live off of Nottingham Road today, um, which again is only a couple of miles from where I was born, is four miles to the Lake County line. So not only do we have to compete within the city and along the, with the inner ring suburbs, but on the east side, Collinwood, Glenville, we have to compete against Lake County. Yeah. That's a whole other ball game. Yeah. So we have, to, we, have to, we have to be the best at what we do. We have to be on top of our game. If not, we're going to continue to be on, uh, on the losing end. Sure. Yeah. The historic Henry W. Longfellow, yes, yes uh, elementary school on the East 140th and right. Devery and, and Darley. Darley. Uh, it's going to be converted into senior apartment living. Right. Tell us about this great project. It was a building that was once one of the architectural jewels of the Cleveland Metropolitan School District. It was closed about 10 years ago, um, and there it sat. And when I picked up that area again with the redistricting, I never represented it. Um, I was appalled by what I was looking at, this beautiful architectural gem, this Renaissance design building to sit there. And, but I also had a very personal reason. When we moved off of 120th, where did my mother move us to? Darley, the street right next to the school, uh, where my uh, father's parents lived. And so I knew that neighbor like the back of my hand. I remember the vitality in it. And, um, and whose family lived right up at the other end of our street was former Councilman Jeff Jansen. It was a, one of the first racially integrated neighborhoods in the city of Cleveland, just an old working class community where it was like, it, it, where all these folks came together, uh, where, where blacks moved up from the South and the Eastern Europeans, well, my family, we all came together to work at the plants, factories in the Collinwood Railroad Yard, then New York Central. The school was the elementary school for that neighborhood. And just to the northeast of that was the oldest African-American neighborhood in the city of Cleveland. So I, know, I, I knew so many families in that neighborhood that I, either, uh, that I either knew personally or I went to, especially the high school with, I couldn't take looking at this building every time I went past it. So I went and I approached the Cleveland Restoration Society and asked for their help. And they, Kathleen Crowder and the board of the Cleveland Restoration Society stepped up to the plate. We formed a committee of folks in, uh, that were concerned about the school. And lo and behold, uh, we asked for um, a request for proposals on the property. 
uh, working in partnership with CMSD, who still own the building. We had four wonderful proposals. We whittled it down to three, then we whittled it down to one. And about, um, about a month ago, the property was transferred to the city of Cleveland, a little over a month ago, transferred to the city of Cleveland by CMSD. In turn, we transferred it to Vesta Corporation, a company out of Connecticut, who now is gonna come in and build a 93 units of senior citizen housing. So um, I'm, not, I'm not gonna cheer yet because we still have some hurdles to go through, but it's been a long time coming and we're hoping that this is gonna be the, um, the impetus to redo the 140th Street corridor from Lakeshore Boulevard to the CSX tracks. And um, it's such a great building. It, in, and it incorporates an entire city block. So I'm excited about it. Um, I'm asking people in the neighborhood to pray that this thing works. Um, this company has a long track record. They did Villa Serena up on Mayfield Road next to Hillcrest Hospital. They've done other major projects across the country. This is estimated to be about $22 million coming into our community. So um, knock on for Micah, I guess, here. And that's right, that, th yeah, th that things will go well and we'll get historic, uh, his Ohio uh, historic tax credits for the property because it's a historic building. It's yeah. been historically landmarked. That's one of the first things I did when I became councilman. I landmarked the building, even though it was empty and sitting there boarded up, I just could not witness or even um, contemplate this building coming down. As we saw so many other school buildings come down across the city, historic buildings. And you saw that there was still potential, it wasn't. Built like a fort. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, after, named after Henry W. Longfellow, uh, magnificent building. And, um, and again, I'm praying that this is gonna work out. Uh, our friends in Brattonall, our neighbors in Brattonall are excited about it as well. In fact, Mayor John LaCasse showed to Mayor Brattonall, who grew up in the neighborhood. He is excited about it as well. I just sent him a copy of the plan. So he said, he, I'm hoping this works as well. Because there, people don't, maybe they don't know this. Collinwood was the biggest neighborhood. The greater Collinwood was the biggest neighbor in the city of Cleveland at one time. Collinwood High School was the biggest high school in the state of Ohio. Think about that. Yeah. When my mother attended Collinwood, there were 5,000 students. Wow. When I attended Collinwood High School in the 60s, there were thousands of students in there. So we went from this high level right after the Second World War, and as we've seen so many other schools and high yeah. schools across the city on this downward slide, and a lot of it had to do with the loss of those big plants and factories. Because yeah. people like to live close to where they work, especially right. in the day. So our neighborhood was hard hit by the loss of manufacturing jobs. No other neighbor in the city of Cleveland lost as many manufacturing jobs as we did, 25,000. Think about that. Yeah. That's the size of most suburbs. Yeah. That's how many jobs we lost there. We had the biggest plants and factories because we were nestled between the Conra uh, uh, New York Central and then New York, and now it's called uh, uh, New uh, Norfolk Southern, and I can't think in a day what it was called. But so all these plants and factories settled right along these two major rail corridors in proximity to the lake, yeah. to the flats. Mm -hmm. So you had all these jobs where you worked three shifts. And across from my grandparents' house on Darley, the Eaton uh, World Headquarters was there, Eaton Corporation. And as a kid, I never saw the lights go off. Yeah. I never saw the lights go off. Three shifts in the summertime when the windows were open, just a, a low level hum coming out of the building. But what did that create? Jobs, yes. opportunity. Mm -hmm. People were able to buy things, invest, create that personal wealth that we so much believe in. So we've lost so much of that in our city and that's why I'm committed to jobs. I'm committed to rebuilding wherever we can. And it's about drawing the line in the sand and saying, you know what, um, we're not gonna keep running. We're, we're not, urban sprawl does nothing for any of us. It only costs us more money. We have to build new roads, new sewer systems, new water lines. We have to build all the infrastructure, infrastructure to support this urban sprawl. And at the same time, the urban areas are declining or have declined throughout the state. Mm -hmm. So we got to get back to an approach of focusing on, in, on our urban neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And if we do that, then we're all going to benefit from that. Even not just us, but even folks who live in a rural area are going to yeah. benefit. Well, it's great that you're repurposing the school as well oh, yeah. because we, we have a pretty strong aging population here in Cleveland. We do. 
And I, I, I can't say enough about we need to have quality housing for not only our citizens, but all of our citizens, because we have many folks that are working poor. Mm -hmm. They have to have decent housing to support themselves and their families. So wherever we can do that, we need to get behind it. I'm committed to that. Longfellow is a passion, just like the Eastside Market was a passion or other projects I'm working on. These are things that, are, are, that I'm looking upon as legacy projects for our community, and I'm not gonna back off at all in those. Well, we have to take a quick break, but sure. there's so much more for us to touch okay. upon in Ward 8. So Thank you. stay tuned for more of Catching Up with Council. Until all our daughters are safe. Until all our children have families. Until all our families have homes. Until all our parents are cared for. We'll be here. Welcome back to Catching Up with Council. I'm your host, Leah Hasledge. Today, we're catching up with Ward 8 Councilman Mike Palencic. Welcome back, Councilman. Glad always to be here. So, a lot of things going on as far as recreation and outdoor. Right. Let's start with the Mark Tromba Playground and Pool. This renovation is going on. Tell right us now. about this. It's a $1.5 million renovation of this park that's named after a, a gentleman who was heavily involved in the Collinwood Village neighborhood, Mark, the late Mark Tromba. And, um, it's just, it's a pool and a playground, again, that I played at as a kid. And that's, as going back to, to my roots, I mean, all these parks and playgrounds, <laughs> you know, in the day, you just didn't go to one park or playground. You know, you got on your bike and you went all over the yeah. place. So I can remember going to this park and playground as a kid. So that's why it's so inspe special to me to be a part of this rebuilding process, to see a new playground going up to see the pool being redone, and we're gonna add a water feature so kids, little ones who can't go in the pool, they can play on, in, on top in a water feature oh, next like to the pool. Like a little splash pad? Right, yeah. so that's all part of the design. It should be done by sometime um, late summer. The work has gone on, it's under well under construction right now. It's on about 157th and, and Mandalay Road at Pomeroy, um, and it's just something that I have pushed for for a very long time because I'll, I've always maintained that we should have recreational facilities in our city that are on par with the suburbs. And far too often we haven't seen that. We've seen facilities that have been substandard. Uh, I have a real hard time with that. I wanna see parks and playgrounds, so like the Collinwood Rec Center. Which is beautiful. Yeah, it's on par with suburban facilities. That's it like has what, four or five years old now? Five years old, it has all the amenities that a suburban facility would have. It's the second heaviest use facility in the city of Cleveland. And again, it's something that we worked very hard on because I want my parks and my playgrounds to, to be on the same par level with suburban facilities. That's how you attract families. That's yeah. how you keep families in the community. You need somewhere to go. Yeah, and again, and since I played in these as a kid, <laughs> I want to I want to I want to have uh, you know, the, the little kids that have the same enjoyment that I had when I played in them or I rode my bike in them. So, I'm committed to seeing all of our facilities upgraded and I, I, I think we need to do a collectively a better job in the city of understanding that. You know, we have we can boast that we have all these facilities. But I'd rather have quality facilities than numbers. I'm about quality versus numbers, and that's what we strive for in our neighborhood. Somewhat it's fun to bike and enjoy is Euclid Creek Reservation. Oh, yeah. You have Euclid Beach Park, you have uh, Villa Angela Park and Beach, Wildwood Marina. Yeah. Um, what's going to be happening there this year? Oh, wow. Year? We're going to have a lot going on. You know, I was, uh, due to my uh, seniority level, I was there when um, the city of Cleveland owned these parks. And again, they were not well run, uh, especially Wildwood was not well run. Uh, Villa Angela was in private hands. Uh, Villa Angela Academy, the Ursula nuns owned that. Uh, Euclid Beach was under private ownership. But uh, Wildwood was owned by the city and was not maintained very well. Um, it wasn't in my ward at the time, but I would frequent there quite often. 
I was determined along with a core group in council in the late 70s to get the parks in the hands of the state, ODNR, uh, Ohio Department of Natural Resources. We worked collectively then with Governor Celeste at the time to get the lakefront parks into the hands of the state. So legislation went in, so then again, Villa Angela was acquired, Euclid Beach was acquired, and they became part of the uh, lakefront park system. When we had Governor Celeste and Governor Voinovich, we had a real, we had two advocates for the lakefront because they lived in the city of Cleveland and they lived on the lake or near the lake. But when they left and then subsequent governors who were from down south didn't have the same commitment to the northeast of uh, the lakefront in general, not just us, but Edgewater across. Mm -hmm. So then I became a, a, an advocate for Metro Parks coming in. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm sure they were tired of hearing from me, the Board of Metro <laughs> Parks and others. I wanted to fill in the link of the Emerald Necklace. That's what I kept saying. We talk about Metro Parks as the Emerald Necklace, but what was missing? The lakefront. Yeah. So we worked together collectively, members of council, core group of us, uh, the, the mayor, Frank Jackson, and, um, and his team, and we were able to negotiate a deal with Metro Parks. So the state backed out, gave us some seed money to go into capital improvements. Metro Parks signed uh, a long, long, long-term lease to take over uh, operation in the lakefront parks. And so we have come such a long way, and we have now parks that are well-maintained that have uh, Metro Parks police in them, capital improvements. We just completed with Metro Parks the Euclid Beach Pier, the reconstruction, the historic Euclid Beach Pier. And I would say anyone, if you haven't been down there, you need to get down there and see that it's a Cleveland beauty. sign. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and we, got, we have the only east side Cleveland sign constructed at Wildwood. Uh, and I can remember walking through the dead of winter with some folks from um, uh, some of our partners to try to figure out where we should put that Cleveland sign. But we're going to put Euclid Beach, Villa Angela, the only east side swimming beach, Euclid Beach and Villa Angela, on the only east side swimming beaches, and Wildwood back on the map. So what are we going to have this summer? We're going to have Wildwood's going to open up where you're going to be able to go down there and buy food. You're going to be able to go down there and sit within a, con uh, a confined area and have a glass of wine if you want and look out over the lakefront. Uh, you're going to be able to bring your boat in and get refueled at Wildwood. Uh, every Friday night at 6 o'clock, we're going to have our Friday night concert series yes, Euclid Beach Live. at Euclid Beach yes. Live. And we, got the, we have a great lineup. We're going to go throughout the summer every Friday night starting at 6 o'clock. So bring your lawn chair, bring your picnic basket, and come and enjoy some of the best music in the city. So if you like classic rock and roll, classic um, soul, um, rhythm and blues, reggae, uh, jazz, that's the place to go on Friday night in the city of Cleveland. And I'm up there every Friday night because I'm part of the, one of the MCs. And um, I, I, every time I stand there on the stage, I look out at that lake and I say to myself, how far we've come. Mm -hmm. How far we've come. I can remember when it was just desolate where debris all over the beach and it wasn't getting clean. And then a pier that had collapsed into the water. And so... To see what I'm looking at now, picnic benches and, and, um, and, and picnic tables and this new pier and a clean beach um, and lifeguards and now the new facility going into Wildwood. You're going to be able to go down there and, have, and buy food and sit there and eat and, and have a nice uh, glass of wine overlooking the lake. Um, it's a dream come true. <clears throat> We're not through. I'm not going to give all the secrets out yet. Some of the other things we're working on for the lakefront with our partners, the Metro Parks. And, and again, I, I tell everyone, support the Metro Parks. They are a true partner. Uh, who, what other communities can brag? I'm, I'm, I'm not just on Cleveland, but Cuyahoga County and beyond. Look at what we have, the Metro Parks. Are we fortunate? Yeah. Are we fortunate? The zoo, the golf courses, all the parks and opportunities, the lakefront parks now. Yeah. We are so fortunate to have the Cleveland Metro Park. So they've been good partners with us. Um, and I'm looking forward to that partnership just continue to blossom and grow. It helps the community. Oh, man. As the lakefront improves, property values 
increase properties, stabilize. People are drawn to the water, want to live close by. So we've seen a migration into our community from folks that want to live near the water that have come in from the suburbs, that have come in from other parts of the state. So I want to continue to see that, that uh, migration in rather than the migration out as we've seen in the past. Speaking of improvements, uh, a street that I consider an artery in the heart of the right. Collinwood neighborhood is East 185. Oh, yeah. And there's about to be a big rehabilitation project going on. Can you tell us about that and the timeline that we're looking at? We are going to um, the, uh, the city's Department of Public Utilities in connection with the Division of Water Pollution Control, WPC, very shortly, uh, maybe within the next couple of weeks, are going to they're going to undertake a major sewer project, which is going to take up about three quarters of the street because of the ongoing basement flooding we've experienced in these severe down uh, rain pours, um, and we see that weather patterns are changing. We're getting more severe rainstorms than we've ever seen, and. In these old neighborhoods where the sewers were put in 100 years ago and where the houses were built 100 years ago, they were not constructed to take this amount of rainfall coming down sure. into the systems. So we're going to put in a new $15 million sewer down 185th Street. That legislation's passed. This contract's been awarded. When that is completed, well, we're going to resurface the street from curb to curb. We're working with our partners in the city of Euclid on interests of common ground. We have had a good partnership with the city of Euclid because however you look at it, that's their front door or back door and the same thing for us because yeah. we divide at 185th up toward Lakeshore Boulevard. So we have major anchors. We have Villa Angeles St. Joseph High School, Euclid Hospital, uh, University Hospital and the Hospice of the Western Reserve anchoring the north. Then to the south we have I-90, mm -hmm. two miles long. So this is historically been the commercial stretch on the east northeast side of the city of Cleveland. So I'm committed working with our Greater Collinwood Development Corporation to start to change the dynamics on that street. So the Law South Theater is in the final stages yes. of that renovation. There's still some work that has to be done. And there were some, you know, we're always upfront and honest. There were some severe mistakes that were made initially with that project. There were some things that were deleted that should not have been deleted from the previous administration up there. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, we've overcome those challenges. Uh, with uh, working with Cleveland Neighborhood Progress, and I can't say enough about Cleveland Neighborhood well, Progress. Tell us about that. That's the CDC for the area. No, Collinwood Development, Greater Collinwood Development Corporation is the development corporation for the Greater Collinwood community. Then we have a small development corporation called Northeast Shores mm -hmm. that is that that owned historically owned the Law South mm -hmm. over these years. Um, now they have partnered with Cleveland Neighborhood Progress Inc. in New Village Capital, who are basically running the Law South Theater. So as Northeast Shores like fades out of the picture somewhat, uh, Greater Cleveland, uh, Cleveland Neighborhood Progress is involved. They are supplying staff time. They are working on a, a more global vision of how this facility can really fit into these two miles of East 185th Street, how we can make it a real destination place for entertainment, uh, arts and media center, working with other businesses on the street. Um, Some new ones just opened up around the, the, the LaSalle. The, that's exactly. Uh, the, the Humphrey Popcorn Classic. Company, Euclid Beach, yeah. they have opened up, they've come back into the neighborhood. So if you want popcorn balls, <laughs> if you want the, the kisses, the candy kisses, if you want Baker's chocolates, yep. They, they, they bought out Baker's Candies and they're operating, selling Baker's Candies out. I was just in there yesterday. <laughs> so uh, they know me very well. I got a sweet tooth for, that, for those products in there. So I was in there um, and we welcomed him to the neighborhood. And then um, the owners of City Desk, which has been a long established city uh, business in the city, they just purchased a major piece of property up on 185th. So we're starting to see this excitement coming onto the street. Then we have our, our old standbys, Muldoons, Muldoons, Muldoons <laughs> Scotties, Chili Peppers, the, the new standard, new operators have taken over yeah. the standard who used to run Club, El, had Club Isabella in, in the circle and a bodega. So now they have come onto the street. We've got other folks coming looking at like Angie Soul Food, um, uh, I'm trying to think of all the other <laughs> restauranteurs <laughs> uh, that are looking at, at East 185th quarter as to knowing now 
that it's becoming the hot spot, the in place to come for. And it's, it's so important that, again, that we have those businesses um, that uh, Zanzibar is another one yeah, that's, yeah. that's looking at the street, uh, which is a landmark up in, in uh, Shaker Square. So we, we are going to work with businesses. Uh, we want 185th to be that eclectic mix of businesses. You know, it's not far from Waterloo. Or you can go to you can go to a Jamaican restaurant, where you can go to the Irish pub, where you can go to get your Euclid Beach stuff, where you can go to Gamer Haven, yeah. um, and uh, another great business on the street, and and just where you, the, uh, bakeries uh, again, all these little eclectic Martin's Menswear, the Family Barbers. Sports, yeah. they're all there. The all these unique businesses. I could go from one block to another and talk about all the unique businesses, and that's why I tell people. Um, what we need in Cleveland, we need people to, to, to take a ride. We need the people to get in their cars and to just drive around and visit around. And I, I, I was taking, yesterday, I was taking a restaurant tour around in the neighborhood, driving, giving the grand tour. Someone who's never knew, knew the neighborhood, lives outside of the Cleveland area. And all he kept saying, I didn't know this existed. I didn't know this was here. I took him up by the lake, took him down to St. Clair Quarter, took him to some of the other, and he, he kept saying that he, he, over and over again in the car. Um, my God, I, I, I've, I've lived, but he, he, he lives out in the Macedonia area. Okay. And I don't even know, what, I forget what county that is, okay? But it was like, I never knew this existed, Councilman. And now that I do, I'm gonna be talking to some of my friends that are business people, small business people, and you know, and you're not, you, you haven't heard the last of us. See, people, so often we get caught into this, yeah. you know, this narrow vision or where we live, or again, let's, we gotta be very honest, perceptions of the east side or the west side, we gotta get all over that crap. Mm -hmm. This is a great city. This is a great town. And the more we realize the assets that we have and the uniqueness of our communities, the better off we're gonna be. So let's take a ride, let's take a little trip, let's experience uh, a different food venue, a, a different maybe house of worship. Let's just, you know, take your time and you're gonna be surprised what you're gonna experience in some of these neighborhoods and how your, your horizons are gonna be broadened. <laughs> That's I what totally I'm like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, people don't know until you show them or tell them. They have no idea that like in a section of our community along the lakefront, all the streets, our private streets, and at the end of each of those private streets is a park on the lake. He couldn't believe what he was looking at. He was astonished that I never knew something like this existed in this city. Mm -hmm. But again, because people don't take the time. Mm -hmm. They get so caught up about hearing about a certain neighbor or maybe something they heard bad about a certain neighborhood uh, or, f or they saw on TV or maybe what they heard from somebody. There's so much information. I tell people, don't pay attention to bloggers. <laughs> <laughs> Don't pay attention to bloggers because, um, you know, if you pay attention to bloggers, you want to dig a, a hole and build a bunker and crawl in it. You know what I mean? Um, don't, don't pay attention to the bloggers and, and, the, and the downers that, that, uh, that so often, you know, uh, pro, you know present a, a different picture, a wrong picture of our city and our neighborhoods. Believe me, I can tell you that as a senior member of the yeah. council. We spoke just briefly about the Community Development Corporation. Right. I, the current one underwent some changes, including yeah. its name. Can you tell us about yeah. that? Well, Collinwood Nottingham Development Corporation, which had been there south of I-90 for a very, very long time, they decided they were going to expand their boundaries. Now they have incorporated the entire Collinwood community, entire Collinwood. So North Shore Collinwood, Collinwood Nottingham, Euclid Green, they have the entire northeast side of the city of Cleveland. So they are embarking upon a major challenge because they saw, they saw weaknesses, they saw things that weren't happening in certain neighborhoods. And they decided through their board and with the support of myself and Councilman Anthony Harrison and the city that they were gonna expand their boundaries and their commitment to the community. So they are working with such groups as Cleveland Neighborhood Progress, with New Village Capital, with the Northeast Shores Development Corporation, which again has shrunken in size substantially, but is still there. But they're working on a more global vision for Collinwood. And that is, again, um, 
whether it be chain reaction, working with local businesses. You know, a, a major investment that just took place in a neighborhood recently was the Cleveland Clinic came in and bought a major complex um, on 152nd and South Waterloo Road. Um, and now uh, they partner with Evergreen Cooperative and that is gonna be their laundry and linen facility for the whole Cleveland Clinic massive healthcare system right there, 152nd and South Waterloo Road. A lot Road. of jobs created with that. A lot of jobs. They're even talking about ex maybe expanding the plant. The name, new Cl Cleveland Clinic name has gone up on the facility at the historic Collinwood Yard. So we're seeing those types of investments in partnership with the Development Corporation, who is not only has to be a cheerleader, but is willing to hold hands with those businesses that need help. Like we had a meeting today with some uh, developers who are looking at buying apartment buildings or possibly even building new or condominiums. So it's how, you know, can you supply us a list of, of vacant land? Can you supply us a list of apartment buildings that could be a sale? So those are all the things that part of their job is to help facilitate business growth and expansion. I'm committed. I'm committed to working with whoever. You know, we need people of goodwill in our neighborhoods. We need believers. You know, I've been in council long enough where I've seen it all. I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, okay? I can recall coming into council in the late 70s where people were writing off, you might not believe this, were writing off Ohio City and Tremont. They thought it was boom, but there were a core group of people in each of those neighborhoods who said, we're not going nowhere. We're not going nowhere. So like in Ohio City or institution, Ohio City was St. Ignatius, St. Malachi, a dear friend of mine, Helen Smith, uh, Mary Rose Okar, in that in, in Ohio City neighborhood and others, um, in Detroit Shoreway, the late father Friscotti. Um, we're not going anywhere. We're going to reinvest. Ohio City, the same thing. Sokolowski's. Yeah. I mean, we're not going nowhere. You know, University Inn. There was this core group of believers, people connected with the West Side Market. So you'd be surprised what a core group of believers can do. We need more believers in our neighborhoods. Okay. If we have believers and business people and individuals, and then with the support of city government, city or county government, you'd be surprised what you can do in these neighborhoods. I don't care how depressed the neighborhood is today in this city, and there are some neighbors that are very depressed. You can turn them around if you have believers and you have a dream and a vision, they can be turned around. We just need more of that. And if we work collectively together versus adversarial, we can accomplish great things in Cleveland. I'm convinced of that. I agree. Yeah. You're talking about housing, uh, a lot of homes in the area have become right. dilapidated and yes. torn down right. um, and more are to come. Yes. What, what do you think is the main thing that led to the situation? Well, there's no doubt the, the housing crisis of 2006, 2008 was the impetus for all this to happen, not only in Cleveland, but throughout the country. Yeah. Other areas or other regions of the country had it, were impacted less because of laws they had on the books in the state as it pertains to financing, how you did financing. In Ohio, for some unknown reason, we have some crazy laws on the books. So if Leah has fallen on hard times and cannot make her house payments um, and, has, and now is faced with a foreclosure situation, as so many people were because they lost their jobs or whatever the case may be, now XYZ Bank evicts Leah and uh, but they don't take possession of the property. It's called a zombie mortgage. It was, it was, it was, um, that term was created by our dear late friend judge, the Honorable Judge Ray Pianca. So you're out of your home, they evict you out of your home, put you out of your house, but now the bank who did it doesn't take possession of the property. Have to pay for it. And there it sits. Yeah. And now it becomes vacant, it becomes vandalized, it becomes tore up, in Ohio, I ask myself, why is that? Why aren't the banks responsible to take possession of the property that they have the mortgage on? Right. What is, what is inherently wrong with that picture? Mm -hmm. But I can tell you what it is because the banks in Ohio have a tremendous lobby. 
and they don't want to be held, they don't want to be held liable for the condition of the property. So now when we go out and cite that property, who pops up when we do the title search? You. Right. But you don't live there anymore. You might not even live in Ohio. You might not even be alive. But your name is still on the, the legal documents. Something is inherently wrong with that picture. That has to change. And I'm hoping some folks in the legislature, I'm hoping in the new governor, who I've been very impressed with, Mike DeWine, up to this point, because he's taking a more pragmatic approach to what we've seen in the past, start to look at things like that. So we had the mortgage meltdown. We had the crisis. But one of the other problems that we've had in the city, which is something I feel very adamant about, we never had a point of sale inspection as other cities have. I believe we need to have a point of sale. Now, I know there's opposition to that. I know the administration doesn't support that. But, um, but I will tell you, had we had a point of sale inspection, we would have never saw the carnage that we've seen in Cleveland. We need, when I say we, I say the city, we need to do a much better job of code enforcement, especially with absentee landlords. We have people buying property in our city today that don't even live in America. I had two properties that were purchased in my community. The, the in, one individual was from Turkey, the other individual was from Russia. And when I met with the individual from Turkey, I said, explain this to me, who bought the property on the internet or what, uh, through, you know, whatever, how he bought it. He said, well, he's, he's telling me, well, property in America, in Cleveland, is so cheap, and this apartment building, if it was in Istanbul, Turkey, where I live, it would have cost $4 million, and I got it here for $400,000. So you have people coming into our city who don't know our city, don't know our neighborhoods, and are looking at making a fast buck, either by flipping the property or by what I call doing cosmetic things to it and then renting it out and creating cash flow, but putting no money back in. We have far too much of that in Cleveland, far too many absentee landlords. That's also tied in directly to the lead crisis we have with properties that are substandard. We have children living in them that have elevated lead levels because of the condition of the property. So I, as most people know, I am passionate about code enforcement. If you own property in my neighborhood, I want you to maintain it. I don't expect it to be like the Taj Mahal or the White House because I know people have financial restrictions, but I don't expect there to be a bunch of garbage in the yard or junk cars or, you know, the roof covered up with a blue tarp, as we see as you drive neighborhoods in the city of Cleveland. We, we collectively have to do a much better job on code enforcement, and then Cuyahoga County, unfortunately, has the worst record of uh, property tax collections in the state. So many of these derelict properties that you just alluded to, rundown properties, Go look at them. They are severely tax delinquent. And you say to yourself, why? Why isn't there any foreclosure action pending? Why isn't there? I just looked at one that I was, uh, was brought to my attention by some concerned residents that was an abandoned home in the Glenville neighborhood. $16,000 in back property taxes, just abandoned. Why wasn't there foreclosure action pending? The county has got to be a partner with us because not only does it affect the city, but how do we fund schools in Ohio? Property taxes. Mm -hmm. So if property taxes are not being paid, the schools aren't collecting their major part of that. So it affects our school system, our ability to improve our buildings, uh, provide educational opportunities. So there, there's a role for individuals, those of us, if we own property to maintain it, but there's also a role a big role for government to enforce the laws, to enforce the code. And if we do that, you're gonna be, you're gonna be surprised how fast our neighborhoods are gonna improve. So do we have to do more demolition? Yes, we do. Do we need to think, step back, and figure out how we can supply funding for people who wanna fix their homes and don't have the financial wherewithal? Doggone right we do, because we have so many working poor families and elderly families, and they just can't repair their home. They can't, you know, a roof today is $5,000 plus. Mm -hmm. If you want to replace your windows, another, on an old house, another 4,000 bucks. You know, your, your mechanical systems, your heating, your, your, uh, your, your furnace. Uh, you can look at what you can put into some of these homes, but if you're living on Social Security, how do you do that? Right. 
or if you're again on, on your family or you, you, or you have children and, and the other part like because I was I experienced that a mom raising a uh, single uh, single head of household specifically moms raising kids in this city and don't have the financial wherewithal to improve their home we've got to figure out I, I know I'm very aggressive on this point we have put so much emphasis in this county on sports complexes you know on sports complexes the brown stadium the, the where the Cavs play the quick and loans arena and and progressive field with the indians we put such an emphasis on that we need to understand that uh that trickle down theory that we had were told that was going to take place as a result of all that investment really has not impacted neighborhoods and we we, we have seen poverty and despair that hasn't diminished We've seen the population of the city not stabilize, and we've seen the population of Cuyahoga County not stabilize. So, you know, what's the definition of insanity? Continue to do insanity the same over thing again. over and over again. And the we, results don't change. Right. So we have to do things differently. We have to realize if we don't invest in people, we don't invest in neighbors, and I'm just not talking about in Cleveland, but if we don't invest in entering suburbs, the older entering suburbs as well, who are experiencing many of the same problems that we are, then we're never going to go where we need to go. So we collectively got to step back, people especially in positions of power and leadership, and especially in a corporate community, who somehow think that, again, this trickle-down theory uh, works. It doesn't. We defy gravity here. And it's been proven over and over again that it hasn't trickled down into the neighborhoods where it needs to trickle down to. If we all, again, rethink our historic positions or our philosophies on some of these things. And again, reasonable people coming up with reasonable solutions, we can start to make significant inroads and changes. That's what my hope and my belief is as we go forward. Because 2020, we're gonna redistrict based the on census. the census. Mm -hmm. That census is gonna tell us a whole lot of what went right and what didn't go right. That's why it's important to fill it out too. Oh, yeah, I can't. I can't begin to tell, and I'm, I'm telling my folks already, do not ignore the census data. It is so critical for us from the standpoint of getting federal dollars and state dollars, I can't begin to tell you. Anyone who disregards the census forms that they get, it's like throwing money in a sewer. You might as well throw money in a sewer because you are not going to get the support. We are not going to get the support from the federal government or state into the city and this county without getting an accurate census. And why some people are afraid of the census forms is beyond me. I, this whole uh, boogeyman stuff about somehow the government's going to learn how many toilets I have or how many <laughs> bedrooms I have. Oh, heaven help me, okay? Please spare me, okay? I, I, I don't care what the government knows about what I have in my home or whatever. If I can benefit my community, by filling out the census forms accurately and in a timely manner, I know I'm benefiting not only myself, but my neighbors, my community, and my city. So brothers and sisters in Cleveland, fill out your census forms. Something you're passionate about uh, and a big advocate for is yeah. more security cameras yeah. in the community, not just in Ward 8, but in all 17 wards. Yes. Tell us about that. Uh, I've advocated this for years. Um, and and, and I, I commend the administration because in this last budget, they set aside funds to um, implement 1,000 cameras citywide. The question is, where are they going? So we still don't know where they're going. Um, my concern is that I express very clear to the, the mayor's folks, especially to Darnell Brown and others, and to the mayor's chief of staff, Sharon Dumas, wonderful lady, that I hope we're not going to see the cameras go downtown or just into quote unquote trendy neighborhoods. We need cameras across the city. If you divide the thousand cameras by the 17 wards, I believe it's 53 cameras per ward. I've been for the last three weeks in trial, sitting in the courtroom for a terrible case called Mr. Carr's, a brutal homicide of a, uh, of a couple who owned a long time business in my community. Uh, they were brutally murdered along with their pet dog. If it wasn't for the security cameras across the street and other instances I know throughout the city where there were security cameras, 
the chance there was a strong pop probability that the people who committed that crime could have got away. Think about that. So last week I was, um, I was talking with um, uh, Michael Malley, Cuyahoga County prosecutor, who, by the way, is doing an excellent job. I can't say enough about the job and his team have done, not only in Mr. Carr's case, but throughout the region, going after these violent predators that are preying upon our communities. He said to me very pointedly, he said, you want to reduce crime in Cleveland, you put up more security cameras. Security cameras that are tied into a central, the central system downtown. Between security cameras and additional police officers in our street will be a tremendous deterrent to criminal activity. So when we talk about getting businesses to come into our communities and or to stay, mm -hmm. what's their number one concern? Besides customers, the safety, safety and security. Residents, I was just watching something today on a monitor about a certain neighbor on the west side where people are having to volunteer residents and residents and neighborhood people to, to, to patrol the parking lot because of carjackings in a parking lot. Now think about that. It's 2019. No resident or group of residents should have to patrol a parking lot of a business, uh, a commercial district for fear of who's going to get carjacked. We got to understand that safety and security next to code enforcement and housing code enforcement is of the number one concern in our city. We need those security cameras. We not only need a thousand, we need more. We start implementing those in our commercial districts and where we have kids. So we have the, you know, around schools or playgrounds, rec centers, things of that nature, but in our commercial districts. You be surprised what a deterrent that's going to be. And if someone still wants to commit a crime, in light of the cameras, the probability of catching them increases substantially. That's just what I heard from the county prosecutor, who, by the way, used to be a councilman. So he knows firsthand the calls and the complaints that he used to get, because I served with Mike in the day in city council. He was a good councilman. Um, so we've just got to get, get ready, and, and, and we've got to get with it, because you just can't keep putting all the cameras in the downtown area. I understand you want to have a safe downtown. I grew up in Cleveland. I want to have a safe downtown. I want to have a great downtown. But I also want to have a great 185th Street and Waterloo Road and St. Clair Avenue and 140th, 152nd, and I should tell you all the rest of my colleagues, whether it be Lorraine Avenue or Denison or, or, wherever, or you know, uh, Detroit, uh, Kinsman, you name it, uh, our residents deserve better security and that's my goal and I'm waiting to hear where those cameras are going so I'm prepared <laughs> how can we be prepared to find out about events and business opportunities and housing with Ward 8 how can okay. we get more information um, collinwoodobserver.com we're one of the few neighborhoods in the city of Cleveland that has its own neighborhood newspaper we're very proud of that fact it's part of the observer chain, so you can get it online or you can come into the neighborhood. It's at all the local businesses in the neighborhood. You can look at the, uh, my uh, Ward 8 uh, newsletter that comes out quarterly, um, and which is mailed to all the households in the community. Um, come and visit all of our neighborhood events. We have the Waterloo Arts Festival, which will be again taking place this year. You can find about, we have uh, the Collinwood, um, we, have, we have our own publication uh, that, that, that uh, summer, the Summer Guide in Collinwood lists all the events. That's all online. But start with the Collinwood Observer, and that will be the, your roadmap to go wherever you need to go to find about all the, the programs and things that are going on. We have so much, we've got one of those neighborhoods that there's always something going on some night somewhere, like a big event last night up at the rec center with 5th District Police and neighborhood organizations. Uh, we have block clubs, we have civic associations, we have beach clubs. Uh, I find that, um, that there's times that I can't, uh, I, I'm trying to think, where am I supposed to be this <laughs> night? So I got to open that calendar to find out where I'm supposed to be. Because again, but that's a sign of a viable neighborhood. You know, when you have participation, and I think that, that, um, w one of the things I need to continue to say to our citizens because in the age of social media, sometimes I know having this discussion with my youngest son when he's on that phone all the time and I have to tell him, um, 
Can you talk? Can you talk to your father <laughs> when we're in the car? Can you get off that cell phone? Um, that we need, um, we need to come out of our doors. We need to pay attention to what's going on. We need to come, show up at a neighborhood organization now and then and show our appreciation. Um, become engaged, become a stakeholder. I can't tell people what a difference that makes. When you look at all of our wards, my ward has about 250 streets. If we just got one person from each street engaged at some level, someplace, somehow, that's a, that's a small little army of people. But start to multiply that, what a difference you can make. One person can make a difference. I'm, um, I, I'm a history buff, as most people know. I'm a, I'm very, and I've, I've used this example very, very often. There's one woman, historic woman, who refused to get to the back of a bus. One woman refused to get to the back of a bus because she was refused that she was not going to be discriminated against anymore. She started a whole movement, one person. We can each start a movement on each of our streets if we want. It, 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 it's, it's not about protesting or marching, just getting engaged, paying attention, being the eyes and ears for the police department. If you see something, say something. I heard an appeal last night by a um, lieutenant in the homicide unit, a friend, personal friend, who lives in my neighborhood. He said, um, it's amazing some of the crimes that have taken place in our city, brutal crimes across our city where nobody has seen anything, nobody has heard anything, and nobody is saying anything. Why is that? Why is that? If you know something, if you've seen something, why wouldn't you not say something? Because if you're not going to get engaged, then what happens when you're the victim? Right. Or your house is broken into, or your car is stolen, or your children and grandchildren are accosted? then who's at fault at that point? I mean, we all have a role. There's only so, there's, there's so much that government can do. I know what my limitations are. I've served virtually in every capacity in city council. You know, the only thing I haven't been is the clerk, okay? And I choose not to be, okay? But I, I've done it all. I've served on virtually every committee in council. There's only so much I can do. I'm one person. And as I find so often, I use the term it neighbored me, you know, let Mikey do it. Well, Mikey can't do it all. I can't be on 250 streets. I can't see everything. I can't, be, I can't see what's behind someone's home. I, I don't know what's going on in that house. So I'm dependent upon the citizens, my citizens, to tell me what's going on or to supply me information. And if we do that, You'd be surprised what the difference you're going to make in these neighborhoods. You will reclaim these neighborhoods. You will set a standard where the people who are up to no good are now going to start looking over their shoulders. They're going to start looking and they're going to start wondering, well, you know, who's watching me or who can see me? Um, and you can start to level the playing field. We will reclaim our neighborhoods. You'll see new investment. You'll see new in involvement. You'll see more new housing. You'd be surprised that domino, that, that snowball rolling downhill, what it can do. It's all about people. People forget the power that they have. One person can and will make a difference. Thank you for making the difference you have and for okay. your over 40 years of service in this community and for being here on Catching Up with Council. It's really my pleasure. It. I'm always glad to be here. Thank you. Thank and you. thank you for tuning in. Of course, we'll have this information for you on our website, tv20cleveland.com. I'm Leah Haslidge. Till next time.